Welcome learners to today's chemistry lesson. Your teacher is Martin Muguswa. In our today's lesson, we're going to discuss industrial processes that are taught in chemistry. We've been able to divide the processes into many categories depending on the form at which you are taught. We have in total eight industrial processes. The first industrial process is called fractional distillation of liquefied air, which was taught partly in form 1 and also in form 3 under nitrogen and its compounds. And this question, whenever it comes in the exam, it comes as a flowchart. The next industrial process is called the harbor, which was taught under the topic nitrogen and its compounds, and it comes in the exam in form of a flowchart. The next one is called the solvay process, which deals with the manufacture of sodium carbonate that was taught under the topic carbon and its compounds, and it comes in the exam in form of a flowchart. The next process is called the Ostwald process, which is a man large scale manufacture of nitric 5 acid, and it comes in the examination as a flowchart. The next process is called the FRASH, which deals with the extraction of sulfur. It was taught under the topic sulfur and its compounds. And when it comes in the exam, it does not come as a flowchart, but it comes as a diagram. We are going to see the difference between a flowchart and a diagram. The next process is called the contact process, which deals with the manufacture of sulfuric acid on large scale, and it comes in the exam in form of a flowchart. The next one is called large scale manufacture of hydrochloric acid, which in the exam will present itself as a diagram. And the last industrial process in chemistry is called extraction of metals. Now, the metals that are extracted are divided into three categories. We have those metals extracted by reduction. One is zinc metal, the next one is iron, the next one is lead. They are all extracted by reducing the oxides. Not their ores, but the oxides. The next category, we have those metals that are extracted by electrolysis and they include sodium and aluminium. We do electrolysis of their molten ores. And the last category is extraction of copper, which relies on three fundamental processes. The first one is called the flotation, which is used to remove the impurities. Then there's the reduction of the ore, where we can use copper and sulfide, or we can also use coke. And the last process is called electrolysis, which is used to refine the copper produced. So that is the preamble of the, met the industrial processes that are going to be dealt with during this lesson. Now, there is a reason why these, we arrange the metals, the processes in that particular order. Fractional distillation is used to manufacture nitrogen, which can be used as a raw material in the harbor. The harbor is used to manufacture ammonia, which is a raw material in the survey, which is also a raw material in the ostrad. Then the fresh extracts sulfur, and sulfur can be used as a raw material in the contract process. So it's important for you to follow them in that particular order when you are doing your final revision. Now, these are the areas that we are going to discuss under the industrial chemistry. Number one is we shall need to know the raw materials for each and every industrial process. Number two, we need to know the chief ores from which the metals are extracted. Remember, when you are quoting the ore, you should write the name of the ore, but not the formula of the ore, because most of these ores contain some impurities. If it is copper, we have the copper pyrite or um, charcoal pyrite. If it is zinc, we have the zinc blend or the calamine. If it is sodium, we have the rock salt or salt chilepita. If it is iron, we have the hematite or magnetite. If you have lead, it's the galena or the sericite, etc. We're also going to look at the sources of each and every raw material in the process. Where do you get that particular raw material in scale? 
We are also going to discuss about the purification process. If it comes to purification process, what is the name of the impurity? How is this impurity removed and why are we removing the impurity? We are also going to discuss the chemical processes that are involved at each and every stage. And when you're discussing the processes, the chemical processes, it is important that we mention the equations for the reactions taking place where applicable. Because there are some processes which require just one equation, like a harbor, like manufacture of hydrochloric acid. But there are others which don't require an equation at all at all. Like, for example, the fresh process. We're also going to discuss about location of the plant. Which other industries can be located near this plant? This is supposed to be subject to availability of a particular condition. We're also going to look at the effects of a particular plant on the environment. For example, pollution effects. How does a particular plant pollute the environment? There is formation of galleys. What is the effect of galleys on the environment? There is global warming, which are some of these greenhouse gases that can lead to global warming. There is formation of acid rain. What is the effect of acid rain? We're also going to discuss on how to minimize some of those effects. Under, for example, something about recycling. What is it that is recycled? And why is it recycled? One of the reasons why we recycle, obviously, is to reduce pollution. Another reason why we recycle is to minimize on cost of production. We're also going to look at conditions. Some of these processes come with the conditions. And these conditions could include the catalyst, pressure, temperature. How much temperature is required? How much pressure is required? What is the name of the catalyst? What happens if the catalyst is not present? What happens if the pressure is not within the range? And these conditions will only be discussed under the contact, the Ostwald, and the harbor. Then, we also need to know the uses of the products of each process. There are some uses which overlap. Like a use of ammonia, that is also a use of nitric acid, that is also a use of sulfuric acid, can be used in the manufacture of fertilizers. A use of ammonia may also be a use of sodium carbonate, softening of hard water. A use of aluminium may also be a use of copper, making of copper, making of electrical wires. Then, the basis of this industrial process like extraction of metals is used in chemistry when it comes to confirming presence of metal ores. That is now the qualitative analysis bit of it. How do you confirm the presence of iron? How do you confirm the presence of copper? How do you confirm the presence of zinc? You notice it is the basis of metals that forms the origin, start of qualitative analysis under inorganic. Then we also have the alloys of some of those metals. So that's what is going to be discussed under the processes. So what we're going now to show on the next screen, on your screen are now the flowcharts involved in each and every process. Remember, the way it is taught is not the way it is tested. So our approach today is actually to look at the flowcharts that are employed in each and every industrial process. And the first industrial process I want us to start with is called the harbor process. You can see it on the screen. This is a flowchart. Remember flowcharts come with the different versions. Sort of mass is drawn like that. Now if you look at the harbor process, it is used in the manufacture of ammonia and it's named after scientists whose name was harbor. Now, which are the raw materials required in the harbor? One is nitrogen, and another one is hydrogen. What is the source of hydrogen? One of the sources of hydrogen is cracking of long chain arcanes. Another source of hydrogen is from natural gas. There are many other sources. Remember in the exam you can be asked to give many other sources from which hydrogen is gotten. Another source of hydrogen is 
we can get hydrogen by electrolysis or brine. I can also get hydrogen by electrolysis of acidified water. Another raw material is nitrogen. We get nitrogen by fractional distillation of liquefied air. Once the two raw materials have been gotten, they are passed through the dryers. The role of the dryer is to remove moisture. Now the dryer is packed with suitable drying agents, like anhydrous calcium chloride or calcium oxide, which can only remove the moisture from the gases, because moisture may act as an impurity. Then from there, the dry nitrogen and hydrogen are then passed through the purifier. And in the purifier, we are removing dust and other particles that may be found in air. The reason why we need to purify is to remove impurities that might poison the catalyst. When we say a catalyst has been poisoned, it means that it is rendered ineffective. Then after that, the nitrogen and hydrogen gases are then compressed to a pressure between 200 to 500 atmospheres. Why do we need to compress the gases? Is in order to shift equilibrium to the right. Or, to put it in simpler terms, we compress the nitrogen and hydrogen in order to bring their molecules together. Remember, nitrogen molecule has triple bonds that require a lot of energy to break. So we need a lot of pressure in order to bring the gas molecules together in order to increase the frequency of effective collisions. Then once the nitrogen and hydrogen have been compressed, they are, the, they are passed straight to what you call the catalytic chamber because we need to activate the reaction. In the catalytic chamber, we meet iron. Iron impregnated with alumina. And the role of alumina is simply a promoter. Then it is in this catalytic chamber that now the nitrogen and the hydrogen impact to produce ammonia. The reaction between nitrogen and hydrogen in the catalytic chamber produces a lot of heat. Therefore, from there, we need to pass the gases through what you call the heat exchanger, where the function of the heat exchanger is actually to exchange the heat. The heat exchanger is used to cool the product, because if we do not cool the product, the heat produced may decompose ammonia to produce nitrogen and hydrogen. We normally say it shifts the equilibrium to the left, and that reduces the yield of ammonia. And notice that in the flowchart that you can see on the screen, the, 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 we, we pass this, the heat exchanger, then the catalytic chamber, then back to the heat exchanger. That also means that the heat exchanger is also used to preheat the gases that are incoming and may not be at a, at a temperature that is sufficient for them to react. Then there are also conditions of temperature in the catalytic chamber. We maintain a temperature of about 450 degrees Celsius. And we maintain the pressure of 200 atmospheres in order for our equilibrium to shift. Then from the heat exchanger, the ammonia gas now is passed through the condenser where it is condensed to become liquid ammonia. In the process, not all the nitrogen and hydrogen may have reacted. Therefore, they are recycled. So they are passed through the pump where recycling is done. And the reason for recycling is in order to cut down on cost of production by minimizing the wastage. There is only one equation for the reaction taking place. Nitrogen plus three moles of hydrogen gives you ammonia. We are using reversible symbols there. Those two symbols that we can see on the flowchart here, they are called reversible symbols, that this equation can go either way, depending on the conditions. If the pressure is too low, equilibrium will mainly be fixed on the left. If the temperatures are too high, the ammonia will decompose. So we need always ensure, because the aim of carrying out an industrial process is to make sure that the reaction um, takes place within the shortest time possible and we get as much products as possible. That is the reason why we are using a catalyst. 
The role of a catalyst is to speed up the rate of the reaction. The forward reaction, we said, is exothermic. Therefore, it is favored by low temperature. If we use too low temperature, then it means the reaction is going to be too slow. If you use very high temperature, ammonia will decompose to produce nitrogen and hydrogen. And that's why we select what we call the optimum conditions. And the optimum conditions are iron as a catalyst, temperature of 450 degrees Celsius, and pressure between 200 to 500 atmospheres. That is what's called the Haber process. I want you to observe that in our last lesson, we had discussed about gas preparations. We also discussed about preparation of ammonia in the laboratory. Now here we're looking at ammonia on light scale. That means the uses of ammonia on light scale are the same as the uses of ammonia that we had discussed under industrial chemistry. The next industrial process is called the Ostwald process. Ostwald process is used in the light scale manufacture of nitric 5 acid. When you are discussing preparation of gases, we also looked at laboratory preparation of nitric 5 acid. Now here we are looking at light scale manufacture of nitric 5 acid. Which are the raw materials? The first raw material is ammonia. The next raw material is air. What is the source of ammonia? The source of ammonia is from the harbor process. And the source of, of uh, air is the atmosphere. However, we do not use the whole air because remember air is a mixture of so many gases. We are only picking oxygen from the air. It is cheaper to get oxygen from air than from fractional distillation of liquefied air. Then, the two gases are then purified. The reason why we are purifying is to remove impurities that might render the catalyst ineffective, or simply we say they poison the catalyst. Then after that, the ammonia and the oxygen are passed through the compressor. The reason why we are compressing them again is in order to increase the concentration of the gases, bring them together to ensure that the reaction shifts very fast to the right. Then in that compressor, the amount of pressure that's applied is nine atmospheres. Nine atmospheres is the recommended. And as we discuss the processes, be picking on those conditions. It's important to know how much pressure, how much temperature is required for each process. Then from there, we pass now the ammonia and air to the catalytic chamber via the heat exchanger. In the catalytic chamber, we meet a catalyst which is called platinum mixed with rhodium. Rhodium is used again as a promoter. Then in the catalytic chamber, ammonia undergoes catalytic oxidation in presence of oxygen to produce nitric, to produce NO and water. And the equation for the reaction taking place in the catalytic chamber is the 45-46 equation. That means 4 ammonia combines with 5 moles of oxygen to produce 4 moles of NO plus 6 moles of water. And that reaction is highly exothermic. By use of oxidation numbers, we can work out the oxidation number of nitrogen on the left-hand side oxidation number of nitrogen on the right-hand side to show that indeed this is called catalytic oxidation of ammonia. Then, the reaction produces out of it, we now pass the gases through the heat exchanger, where the function of the heat exchanger here is now to cool or remove the heat that was produced in the catalytic chamber. And once we cool, we now move on, the, the, we move on to the oxidation chamber where the NO is meant to combine with regulated amount of oxygen in the oxidation chamber in order to produce NO2. That is what's happening in the chamber number five on your screen. So the NO combines with oxygen to produce NO2 in chamber number five. Then from there, we move on 
to what we call the absorption tower. In the absorption tower, the NO2 meets hot water. The hot water combines with the NO2 and any unreacted air. Any air that any oxygen that had not reacted in the oxidation chamber also comes in. And the reaction in the absorption tower produces nitric 5 acid. So the equation that keep place in the absorption chamber is 4NO2 plus 2 water plus oxygen to produce 4 nitric acid. And the nitric acid is tapped off as 65% nitric acid. When we say 65%, it means that 65% is the nitric acid, 35% is water. If I want more concentrated nitric acid, I can do what you call further distillation. Or I can just pass the nitric acid over concentrated sulfuric acid to remove some of the water for it to become more concentrated. That is what is called the Ostwald process. Again, we have manufactured the nitric acid. The uses of the nitric acid we have prepared here and the uses of the nitric acid we have discussed under the preparation of the gases remains the same. Now, one important thing I want you to pick from these flowcharts is that the flowchart for the manufacture of sulfuric acid, manufacture of ammonia, and that one for the manufacture of nitric acid may look the same. Because all of them have a purifier, all of them have a compressor, all of them have a heat exchanger, all of them has a catalytic chamber. That way, you don't have to cram the steps. Whatever is happening in one purifier is also in the same. Whatever is happening in this compressor is also the same. The heat exchanger does the same thing, and the catalytic chamber also does the same thing. The uses of the nitric acid remain the same as we had discussed much earlier. The next process, number three, is called the contact process, which is used in the manufacture of sulfuric 6 acid. Now, the Ostwald was named after scientists. The Haber was named after scientists. But the contact process is not named after scientists because you don't have a, cut, a scientist called contact. It is called the contact process because the production of SO3 occurs when SO2 and oxygen comes in direct contact with the catalyst on the surface of the catalyst. That's why it's called the conduct process. Which are the raw materials? One of the raw materials is sulfur or metal sulfide. And an example of a metal sulfide is uh, zinc sulfide or lead sulfide galena generally. Now in Guinea it's called a zinc blend. Then we also need air. Dry air, the air must be dry. You can get by fraction distillation, you can just get from air. Sulfur, the source of sulfur is the flash. What happens in this process? The sulfur or the metal sulfide is reacted with oxygen to produce sulfur for oxide. So the equations, you can see them on the flowchart at the roster. Sulfur plus oxygen gives you SO2. Zinc sulfide plus oxygen gives you zinc oxide and SO2. I can also use red sulfide or zinc blend. Once I produce the zinc SO2, is then again passed through the purifier. The role of the purifier is to remove impurities such as dust, such as arsenic compounds, which might poison the catalyst. Then from there, the pure SO2 and pure oxygen are then passed through the drying tower where we remove moisture. We can dry the gases by use of concentrated sulfuric 6 acid. Then once we have dried them, we now move on again to the catalytic chamber where SO2 combines with oxygen to produce SO3 in presence of a catalyst. One of the catalysts that is used in the catalytic chamber is vanadium 5 oxide. The other catalyst can also be used is platinized asbestos. However, vanadium 5 oxide is more preferred over platinum because of two reasons. One, vanadium 5 oxide is cheaper. Another reason is that it is susceptible to poisoning, not easily poisoned by impurities. The reaction in which SO3 is being produced 
it is releases a lot of heat because it's highly exothermic. Therefore, it passes through the heat exchanger in order to cool the products and also preheat the cold reactants. Then we go to the absorption tower where the SO3 is absorbed in concentrated sulfuric 6 acid to form oleum. There is a reason why we don't absorb SO3 directly in water. Because one, SO3 dissolves in water with the evolution of a lot of heat, which may vaporize the acid to form fumes that are very difficult to dissolve. But when it dissolves in common sulfuric acid, the reaction produces a lesser amount of heat. And then the oleum is H2S2O7. You can see on the screen the equation in which oleum is being formed. And then lastly, you go to the dilution chamber where the oleum is carefully diluted with water to give us sulfuric 6 acid, which is 98%. When you talk about 98%, it means that it contains very little amount of heat. And that is the equation for the reaction in which sulfuric acid is formed. Oleum plus water gives you sulfuric 6 acid. In our next lesson, we are going to continue with the conduct process and look at some of the effects that this particular process may have on the environment.